Okay, now I'd like to turn it over to um, uh, someone who's with us locally, Dr. Jeff Bardwell, the Assistant Professor, School of Public Health Sciences at University of Waterloo, and, a, and a formerly uh, from uh, BC. And Jeff uh, did present on our first uh, drug strategy uh, or drug uh, town hall last year. So Jeff, uh, hopefully you're still there. <laughs> I, I am here, but I, I don't see my video, but I mean, I don't want to see myself anyway. So. No, no, that's good. No, hey, okay. hey, thanks. Over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I was invited to come speak here, and given the title of the talk, I decided I would talk about what would be some considerations we might want to make in Waterloo region uh, for a local drug strategy. I'm just listing my financial disclosures here where I receive funding for my research. Um, so I'm at University of Waterloo. My expertise is in public health, looking at uh, smaller urban, rural, and remote settings. I focus on drug policy and strategies and a variety of interventions, including opioid agonist treatments, uh, so some things that Tara mentioned earlier, supervised consumption services. And I'm also inter interested in the role that technologies might play in addressing uh, some of these issues. Um, so I moved here a couple of years ago, as uh, Councillor Deutschman said, uh, from British Columbia. And when I got here, I realized, uh, or at least I, th I uh, thought that there was no local drug strategy that existed. Um, and so I did some digging. Uh, and, you know, there are things that are listed in particular plans. So looking at uh, regional council, for example. Um, also, in 2018, there was an opioid response plan that was uh, developed. And, and in this, it stated that action plans would be developed and progress would be measured and reported to regional council twice a year. Um, but I haven't seen any actual evidence of this occurring. Um, so, so part of this is, is really thinking about like what exists locally and what can we do? Um, so I, I do want to say from the outset that there's a variety of services that do exist locally and also willingness among community members. So I'm not here to say that there's nothing happening here, but when it comes to looking at a community led uh, and a very comprehensive drug strategy, something like that does not exist in Waterloo region. Um, and there's been a variety of uh, chat uh, around this issue over at least the last couple of years since I've been here, but likely before that. Um, so this kind of begs the question, what is in a drug strategy? Uh, and so obviously I don't have time. I was supposed to do the seven minute TED talk. So <laughs> I'm going to kind of just fire some like key elements uh, and then provide kind of like a, a case example of, of what something might look like here. Uh, so in the drug strategy, you want to work with people who have that experience, people who have the lived or living experience, as well as community partners. These are the experts. Uh, other people need to stay in their lane. Like these, we want to be working with people who uh, are affected by this, either through their work or, or through their livelihoods. Um, second, you want to determine what's known. So, what do we know about uh, substance use in Waterloo Region? And in that, you would identify gaps, whether this is gaps in knowledge or gaps in services. Uh, and then you want to define what are our goals uh, as a region and what might be some objectives we want to achieve. And with, with this, you would develop and implement strategies and tactics. And I'll get to this more in depth in a second. Uh, and then you'll design an action plan. You'll want to monitor and evaluate this. So it's not simply just doing things and not uh, seeing if they're actually working. Um, and then adapting and changing. Um, so kind of a good segue building off of the last presentation is looking at smoking opioids and overdose death in Waterloo region. Uh, so starting with determining what is known. Um, so when we look at uh, uh, coroner's data uh, across Waterloo region, uh, we see some key, th key th things here when looking at injection versus inhalation. Uh, so at the top here, we see uh, from 2018 to 2021, there's a decrease in, in evidence of injection drug use only among people who have died from uh, an opioid-related death. Um, and then secondly, evidence of both injection drug use and pipe foil for inhalation. So we see actually an increase from 2018. And then the last line, evidence of pipe foil for inhalation only, also seeing a uh, significant increase since 2018. Um, what else is known? Uh, so I was a part of the Waterloo Region Consumption and Treatment Services Evaluation last year. 
Um, and when looking at mode of consumption, so similar to what Tara is finding at a more provincial level, uh, in this survey, 54% of uh, consumption and treatment service clients reported a preference for inhalation. And then among those surveys who weren't accessing the service, 52.8% uh, reported no place to smoke drugs and that they didn't inject drugs. Uh, so there's a, a, a there's clearly an issue here. And then lastly, uh, there's this a great report that came out yesterday from uh, public health locally uh, called Understanding Drug Use in Waterloo Region Report. Um, and in this, it shows an increase in demand at harm reduction programs for smoking supplies. Uh, so looking at when pipes were first distributed in 2018 uh, until 2023, that we see a 300% increase. So obviously that is something that is known and we need to identify the gaps, sorry. Um, so in identifying gaps, you'd want to do an environmental scan, um, ask questions such as what programs and services currently exist that target drug smoking in the region? Who is interacting most with people who smoke drugs? How might existing infrastructure be improved? Uh, what evidence-based strategies exist that target drug smoking and how might these be tailored to our local context? And then we move into defining objectives and developing strategies and tactics. Um, and again, these are just examples. Um, I just wanted to throw something on the page here. Um, uh, and anyway, so perhaps the goal locally is to reduce opioid overdose and overdose death among people who smoke drugs. And so an objective, you'd wanna be very specific, have a timeline um, and make it measurable. So by 2027, reduce the number of opioid overdose deaths related to drug smoking by 40% across Waterloo region. Again, just putting at random numbers here. Um, so strategies uh, would be, how do you reach the stated objective? So this would be audience specific and importantly, evidence-based. It's not simply where it's like, we're just gonna try this for the fun of it. You want to have some sort of evidence base for it. So an example of a strategy could be implement programs to communicate and address the risks from smoking drugs. And then how would we go about this? These would be the tactics. So, and, and importantly, these are all evidence-based um, and I have citations that I'll share at the end. So tactics could be hire people with lived experience to conduct educational outreach targeting people who smoke drugs. Second, Implement a warm referral system for opioid agonist treatment within existing community partners who interact most with people who smoke drugs. So this would likely be people such as paramedics, uh, people who work at harm reduction sites, street outreach workers, police, and so on and so forth. And then finally, pilot a smokable opioid agonist treatment for individuals most at risk. So Rob, you had a question earlier uh, about what could be done for people who uh, are smoking drugs. Well, I mean, there is research that has been done on smokable uh, opioid agonist treatment uh, in Europe. Um, and so perhaps this could be something that's piloted. We, we know, for example, people with who inject drugs, uh, there's a variety of uh, injectable opioid agonist treatments that exist. Um, and so it's kind of meeting people where they're at and they're using their preferred mode of consumption to uh, use a treatment, for example. Um, and then other key steps, which I'm not going to get into, but I have to mention, uh, is really about designing an action plan. So who's involved, what are the timelines? And the key point here is too, is what is the budget? We're not gonna just keep having monthly meetings and talking about things. We need some money and we need to hire some people and, and, and put some things into action. Uh, uh, and then you wanna monitor and evaluate things. So, so we, we've implemented everything. Uh, how will we measure the effects? Um, and importantly, are there factors that are affecting the implementation or the uptake of these? And then we want to adapt and change. So it's not simply it's like, oh, this has worked somewhere else. There might be uh, key considerations locally that we want to consider. Um, and so we want to keep coming back and revisiting these things. And then my last slide is really, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone on the panel is going to have a similar slide is there's no silver bullet, right? Uh, we're not going to have one intervention that's going to address everyone. Um, but the key thing here is that well-designed, implemented, uh, and evaluated strategies are really key to informing our work. We're not simply just doing what sounds good. We need to actually uh, be smart about it. Um, so that's everything and happy to take any questions. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah, you know what? That seven minutes was very interesting, Jeff, just so you know. Okay. Uh, first off, though, I just want to, in case no one else knows this, uh, the, the, the phrase opioid agonist treatment, as a layperson, this was new to me because Paxton sent me an article. Uh, and so I had to look up opioid agonist treatment to see what it meant. So can you just just briefly just explain what opioid agonist treatment means for any of the lay people here that are not familiar with that phrase or term? Should I uh, punt this to the uh, clinician on the on, on the call? Oh, see, I, mean, that's I, I know what it is, but I, I mean, I think Paxton. All right, uh, Paxton. Yeah. OK, Paxton, go ahead. Sure. Elude. <laughs> sure, I can dive in because I spend a lot. So, opiate agonist treatment is 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 as medical management. It's the gold standard of treatment for an opioid use disorder or an opioid addiction. It's 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 uh, the med. They are the medications that we prescribe to treat these disorders, including things like methadone and suboxone. They are they fall within that spectrum of treatment and, you know, not to, not to jump the queue. Um, but I think that um, I, that's, I, I thank you for, for prompting on this um, Rob, because I think it's really important that we be specific when we're talking about treatment, about what it is we are talking about, because that encompasses so many different things that may or may not be practical in so many different settings that um, being specific, you know, in this case, we're talking about methadone, suboxone, or a medication called slow release or morphine, the best evidence medications we have for, for, for pre preventing death in people with opioid use disorder. Um, that is that that would be OAT um, okay. or OAT. Thank you, Paxton. And, and um, just on that, I had a great chat the other day with uh, a person from it's called RAM, R-A-A-M, but I don't, I forget now what the acronym stands for. And Rapid that's- Rapid Access Addictions Medicine. Thanks. See, I got the right people on tonight. So yeah, exactly. So it was a great conversation about the work that they do in our community. Now, Jeff, I just want to ask you, with this, you know, uh, rough plan that you, you put together, uh, what we need provincial and federal authorization to create this? I mean, n no, no, not, not, not to develop a strategy. I mean, no, no, I, no, but to implement this inhalation concept that you're talking about. So, uh, yes, uh, in, in terms of looking at uh, inhalation as an OAT, uh, an opioid agonist treatment, absolutely, because uh, so what's used, at least in Europe, is diacetyl morphine, and it, it, it's smokable. So there need to be uh, a Health Canada approval for that, I believe, unless things have changed. Uh, uh, but, um, but again, uh, you know, governments need to work together. And so, right. um, you know, am I, this is, I'm just kind of throwing out ideas. Uh, do I have a, a local drug strategy in my mind? I have some ideas for sure, but I just wanted to kind of run with that thread because we've known for years that smoking is trending and, and people are dying from smoking related um, deaths, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I just wanted to just clarify that sort of what Tara had referred to earlier about the cooperation amongst the different levels. And that's one of the elements uh, I think that sometimes is a little bit frustrating at the local level uh, is yeah. whether we're able to do what we need to do, but feel hindered sometimes by approvals that have to be sought. And I'm not going to get into the political. We can all read the papers and see how a lot of this is becoming political. Um, just the other thing I just wanted to mention, and it's mentioned here by Tanya Evans in the chat, um, your reference to uh, people with lived experience and putting the plan together. And I think we're seeing whether it's homelessness or drug strategy, uh, we're seeing a lot of that now, the recognition that we have to include people with lived experience uh, as part of that. Thanks, Jeff.